between sin and the difference between sin and Aparadi is very great thing. Uh, the sin is when a person acts against dharma. And Aparad is when one acts against bhakti. So offense, Aparad means offense to Bhakti Devi. And sins are simply transgressions of the dharma duties related to the body and mind in the Varnashram social system. Зачем вы видите будущее сознание Кришны, как оно будет развиваться? Как вы видите будущее Кришны, как оно будет развиваться? Наши ученики сказали, что сознание Санкиртан будет распространяться все больше и больше по Сила Бхактистан Сутакур has said that the Gaudiya Sampradaya and Vallabh Sampradaya will be, become again one. And then Сила Бхактинат Такур said gradually, gradually all the various uh, religions of the world they will blend into the Brahma Madhva Gaudiya Sampradaya. <laughs> and uh, for this to happen, there's a lot of work for us to do. And perhaps in our lifetime we will not see uh, this, the result of this. But if you sleep during Japa, you can see it in your future lifetimes. It is not uh, of, uh, too much concern. We are simply doing our duty without attachment to the result. Like Sri Krishna told Arjuna, you should take up your bow and arrow and fight and don't consider, don't think about whether you will win or lose. Bhakti is effective just by, for the individual, just by his engagement, even though from a worldly perspective it may appear to be useless. For example, if an eagle is coming to kill a rabbit, so then the rabbit closes his eyes. But it will not save him. Hmm? So that activity was useless. So similarly, sometimes the activities of bhakti produce some results which people can see, oh, it was very effective. And sometimes they don't produce any worldly results. Uh, 
But they are completely effective transcendentally. For example, our Gopal Srinathji, he told Srila Madhavanda Puri, oh, go to South India, I am feeling hot, go to South India and bring me some chandan and to uh, massage me with the sandalwood. <laughs> Madhavanda Puripada was very old. And uh, he walked all the way to South <coughs> India and he went to Puri, he went to Puri and he collected very good sandalwood there. And then on the way back, he was not far from Puri, on the way back he came to Ramuna, to the ancient temple of Kircho Gopina. Open it. And uh, Gopal told him when he was in Ramuna, oh, you give all the sandalwood paste to Kirchhoff and Gopina. Because uh, he is not different from me. And Srila uh, Madhavanda Puri passed away there, his samadhi is in Ramuna. So one may say that he set off on a mission to bring the Chandan from South India to Srinathji in Vrindavan and he failed. But transcendentally, he was completely successful. <laughs> Even though he could not make it back to Vrindavan, but Srinathji accepted there, transcendentally, in another way. So, we should not be attached to any result. We do our duty following the order of our Guru Parampara. And the result is that we will attain the lotus feet of Sri Krishna. Krishna will come and place his lotus feet upon your heart. And when you have the darshan of Krishna's lotus feet and you remember them, always and only serve Him, then that is actually Sharnagati, actual surrender. <laughs> so until that time, we'll have to be fully Sharnagat to Gurudev. Because we have not uh, any realization of Krishna. So, Sri Guru Charane Rati Ese Uttamagati. By being very attached to the lotus feet of Gurudev, one attains perfection. If someone is attached to his Gurudev in the heart very deeply, then Sri Krishna will come and he can then experience what it means to be surrendered to Krishna. We see it's common that many devotees are preoccupied with some prophecies. If you want people to think that you are crazy, you can preface all your sentences with according to the prophecy.
When did Jesus came to Pontius Pilate? He said, Pontius Pilate said, oh, the people say that you have come to establish a kingdom. And he said, my kingdom is not in this world. So the transcendental Vaishnavas, their hearts are fixed on the eternal service of Radha and Krishna. That is their primary objective, Prayojan. And incidentally, uh, all the worlds will benefit. That is Anusangik. Anusangik means incidentally. So don't be absorbed in uh, prophecies of the future of this plane. When in the final pastimes of my Guru devotees were drawing up the protocols and the um, constitution of the institution. But many, many pages of uh, managerial and organizational uh, procedures. Good, I said, you can do something, but don't be so concerned about this. Because Carl, time is such, you cannot control what will happen. <coughs> you may put everything into making a managerial and organizational structure and everything can fall apart. So Srila Prabhupada used to say that instead of meetings, and the resolutions and revolutions and no solutions there should be kirtan and no solutions there should be kirtan because if one is chanting purely then all management will be at the, his fingertips because everything will go on by the mystic power of his Nam Bhajan. One devotee asked my Gurudev, he was a sannyas, he said, who will be the Acharya after you leave? Uh, I think uh, you. <laughs> but he did not like like I am appointing you. He said, yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> it was quite dismissive. <laughs> so then that devotee said, can can you put that in writing? <laughs> Then Gurudev said, I am not concerned with these things. I am a follower of Shukadeva Goswami. Do you think when Shukadeva Goswami was speaking Srimad Bhagavatam to Prakshit Maharaj, he was thinking, who will be the Acharya after me? <laughs> No, he just appeared there, Shukadeva Goswami appeared there, no one know, knew where he came from. He spoke Srimad Bhagavatam, then he got up and walked away and no one know, knows where he went. So my Gurudev said, so I am like that. 
said, it looks like I am the uh, Acharya and head of one institution. But this is external vision. I am just appearing, speaking Harikata and disappearing. So, this is my opinion on prophecies about the future. Our future should be a dosa, ta 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 sadhu, sangha ta bhajana kriya, ta ta na ta ni vati shad, nishta rujya, sakti bhav, prem. And every individual has to fly his own plane. You know, sometimes in the military, the uh, airplanes are flying in formation. And they look like one group. Hmm? But if one of the airplanes runs out of fuel, then the group will not help. He will drop from the sky. Yeah. So in the same way, we are in a group. Yeah. But everyone is individually responsible for their sadhana, so that they can go through these stages. Another question, raise your hand. Mm. Yes, Madhavi. I wanted to ask a question after the after we heard about the hellish planets. I don't truly really understand how it works. When uh, I thought that uh, when, for example, a person eats meat, then they take birth in the body of uh, an animal or someone else and they get eaten, like, according to karma in this world. But then also they go to hell and how does it work? I mean, is the karma, this, the reactions are suffered by a person in this body or in hell and this world? I don't understand the process. The... Ah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. The sufferings are not in a gross body. They are in a subtle body. Anyway, all suffering is in the subtle body because the gross body is always dead and has no feeling. It is judged in art. Because in, if you have a gross body, and you put through the uh, grinding machine, like uh, cane juice. Then you just uh, you go through once, and then your body is finished. Um, so it will be over in uh, five seconds. <coughs> but when you go to the narak, that that, that hell. Uh, for many, many years. So you have a subtle body, so you can be squished again and again and again and experience that pain, but without... Uh, it, does, it, it won't come to an end. It will go on until the duration of your sins has become... Uh, the tasted, you have tasted the fruit of the sin. So, then, so that was one part of the question, what kind of body, and the other part was? Uh, you were asking, 
about uh, people who eat meat and no, it's not like that. If you, if a person has knowledge, then and then they transgress dharma, then they get heavy reaction. For example, it is said if a Brahmin eats meat, then he has to go to hell for so many births. Why? Because he should know better. Those who are in the taken human birth, but in the uncivilized, very low uh, position. They are very much in the mode of ignorance, so their food stuff will be in the mode of ignorance. So they are acting according to their adhika. But if someone is born in a developed civilization with a developed uh, dharmic principles and they transgress those dharmic principles, uh, then they will definitely, uh, Yamaraj will give them a very severe punishment. So Chitra Gupta is keeping a record of everyone's activities. And at death, the living entities are both before Yamaraj and then Yamaraj will give his verdict. It's a court, court of Yamaraj. So just like a very young person, they don't get the same type of uh, um, sentence as a mature person. So Yamaraj will decide. So Srimad Bhagavatam is extremely beautiful because first this in the fifth canto is Tanam and then sixth canto Poshanam. So Tanam means how a living entity gets a particular destination according to his activities. And then Poshanam means how the Supreme Lord, out of his causes mercy, protects the living entities that they will not get those terrible destinations. Okay. So the uh, the description of, of hell is to set the context, to express the mercy of the Supreme Lord, especially in the form of His Holy Name. So don't get caught up in the end of the fifth canto. I know some devotees, they are so absorbed in the end of the fifth canto. Chanting Hare Krishna and meditating. Maha Rora Kumbi Patra Ashi Patra. Meditating on 28 hells. The Srimad Bhagavatam is full of brain. So it's just giving a context to express the extreme mercy of the Supreme Lord. Any other question? You might. I would like to ask you what is the meaning of Shika? Why do devotees marry? Meaning of Shika? Well, you have seen on the top of the temple there's always a flag. It indicates that the deity is living there. So then we have a flag. Indicates the deity Krishna is living there. So 
once someone asked my guru this. this. He said that uh, uh, previously in his uh, younger days, if there was a radio, the radio had to have an antenna. And you have to extend the antenna to pick up the station. He said, so this is the uh, antenna for picking up the station of Goloka Vrindavan. <laughs> It is meant also to mark the Brahma Randra, where the, you see the sinful persons when they die, their soul leaves down. But when the um, pious persons leave, then the soul goes up and up through the Brahma Randra and is liberated, goes through by Kunta. So one of the angles of Bhakti is called Vaishnav Chintharan to where the signs of a Vaishnava. So the Buddhists, they have no secret. Because they are worshipping Shunya, nothing. So they have nothing. But Vaishnavas keep the Sika, it's a sign of their, that they belong to the devotional uh, tradition, not to the impersonal tradition. Very <coughs> So, Shila Vishnu Thakur in his comment on the verse Nasta Prayesho Bhattari Shu Nittam Bhagavata Seva Bhagavatur Uttama Shloke Bhakti Bhavati Naishtiki He said Naishtiki means uh, Chitaika Agrata Ekagrata means one pointed chit. Means that mm, at the time of hearing, chanting, and remembering, then the rajasic, the elements of Rajas and Tamas are absent and there's some only mm, the more sattvic chitta vrittis are present. So it is a steadiness of the chitta. Do you understand chitta? It is the mind stuff, if you like, <coughs> the, 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 the substance of the psychological body. When it's moving, you, the movements of the chitra experience in the form of desires, thoughts, conceptions, and so on. So, those types of conceptions include identifying with the physical body. So when the chitta becomes steady, then you will just lose that sense of physical identification. So, uh, these are, this is the main symptom of Nishta. You can define Nishta in a negative way, which means you are devoid of lie, big shape, 
Aprativati Kasai and Rasasvad. Five things. Lai means tiredness, laziness, sleepiness. Does it, the devotee still takes rest at night, but it means that he does not feel these things when he's doing bhakti. Bhikshet means distraction. Aprativati means uh, that a person feels indifferent to devotional activities. In other words, he's not sleepy and he's not distracted, but he's not feeling attached to the devotional activity, feels indifferent. Kasai means the tendency to be uh, to become <coughs> triggered by past sanskars and past habits. To suddenly become angry in some situation and so on. This is Kasai. Rasaswad is the tendency of the mind to dwell on uh, sense gratification. So, the tendency of the mind is if you have no sense gratification, the mind will fantasize about some sense gratification. So, this is Rasaswad. When these five things are absent, then you can think you have come to Nishta. <laughs> and because the mind is steady, then it has the quality of Svachattva. That means when you chant, you can start to see the form of Krishna. <laughs> and to a limited degree experience his qualities. This is... Everyone has to start from Nishta from the beginning. Because before Nishta there is Anishtata. Before steadiness there is unsteadiness. So we are always striving to not be flaky. To not be one day up and one day down. To have consistency. Yeah. And the, uh, sometimes the Christians, their saints, or oh, they give the name Constance. Constance means this time. Be constant in one's daily devotional activities. One more question. Satyan. You said that we are going to go to Rafa Raman. There are questions in this place. What is it that Rafa Raman changes in our three main qualities? И почему так считают, узнаем. И второй вопрос. Очень часто в этом храме собираются представители разных сопродай, и мужчины переводят их только танцуют. Почему именно это место, вот, у них такое излюбленное, что-то знают? Вы знаете, что вы говорите, 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 что uh, comprises uh, the dashes of the three deities, uh, Madan Mahan, uh, Govinda, Jai Govinda. So, why is it so? And then, uh, when you go to the Rajaraman temple, 
very often you can see some representatives of opposite modalities, for example, men drive stethoscopies and dancing. Why are they attracted to this place in particular? Krishna is not uh, three. Krishna is one. But he is realizing three stages. So, our uh, Sanatana Goswami, he manifested the deity of Madan Mohan. And he, he, in his writings, he especially discussed the Sambandha Gyan. Madan Mohan is who is so beautiful, even he bewilders Cupid. So first one has to experience the beauty of Krishna in such a way that one forgets all relationship with the material plane. And that is Sambandagya. Because uh, Sambandagya means to know that you are related with Krishna and you are not related with any ephemeral, uh, temporary material things. Then Govindaji, in the Pranamantra to Govindaji, it describes a yoga pit. He's present in the Brindavan yoga pit. So the service to Radha Krishna in the yoga pit uh, that the Sakis are performing, serving under their guidance internally is our Abhideya Tattva, the process. Then Gopinath is a Bhangsibhat. So this Rasalila is a part of the flow of Astakalya Lila, the Prayogen, Prayer. At first Gopis are in their homes. And he plays and calls them and from there they run. And then they have Rasalila and visit different Kunjas and bathe in Jamuna. And at the end of the night they return to their homes. So these are stages of realization. It is a way of expressing the nature of our development evolution in Bhakti. But still, it cannot be said that if a person has come to the highest level of bhakti, then he will not worship Madan Mohan. Mohan. Or that Rupa Goswami will not serve Govinda Dev when he is in the stage of Prayojan. So it's a way of expressing our uh, the, how the Vedic knowledge comes in the three parts, Sambandha, Abhideya and Prayoja. And uh, Radharaman is said to be all three because of the, there's a passage I will tell there. Why tell here, we will tell there. Radharaman is also Mahaprabhu. Because he is Radha and Raman together in one form. But we will tell. And why Apasapradaya? Apasapradaya can go anywhere. You can 
can't see men dressed up as women anywhere on the train. If you go on the train, they always go on the train also. Anywhere? They're coming from carriage to carriage, and then they sit down next to you, and then they start insulting you and harassing you until you give them some money, then they go to the next carriage. That's how they make their money. In Radharamani, usually they have some uh, kirtaniyas doing rag seva. So the local persons like to go there and dance. So don't be concerned about that uh, these people go in Radharamani. It's not a feature of the Radharamani temple. And it has nothing to do with Radharamani. You can see there join this con also. <laughs> or anywhere else. Let's have one more question. Sachi. Vaishnava Seva means actually to a Vaishnava. That means at least Madhim Bhagavata. We can serve all the devotees on the order of Bhadyam or Uttam Bhagavata. My good have used to say, serve all the devotees to please Guru Dev. But please, but you cannot serve Guru Dev by pleasing all the devotees. You understand? <coughs> you can serve the devotees to please Guru Dev, but you cannot serve Guru Dev by pleasing the devotees, all the devotees. <laughs> because. Uh, there may be some, but many uh, devotees are still in the Prakrit materialistic stage. So they can also be pleased by Maya. They are pleased when their uh, conditioned propensities become fulfilled. Everything we do for the pleasure of Guru Dev, and that may include serving everyone. But we cannot think that just pleasing everyone will be Guru Seva. So, service means to please the object of service. So the best service is Mano Bhishta Seva, serving the innermost heart's desire of the Vaishnava. If the service that we do is not in accordance with the Vaishnava's heart, then it will not be pleasing, even though outwardly it looks like this service. Let's say a Vaishnava comes. It's a January the 10th. It's very cold. And Vaishnava is sneezing. And then you come and you worship him with sandalwood paste. So it looks like you're doing seva, but you're not doing seva. Because a new pace makes you become more cold.
Then, after you made him more cold with the sandwood paste, then you take a fan also. A fan. <laughs> But he's very thirsty. Oh. He wants some water. Oh, we didn't eat. But you bring him some salty samosa. <laughs> Please, try to be in control. <laughs> Would you make more thirst? <laughs> So service is meant to please the object of uh, So for that, one will have to understand the Vaishnava's heart. So the neophyte devotee don't understand their Guru's heart. So they have to be told exactly what to do. Otherwise, they'll do wrong things. And so, and even being told, they don't do it. So that's the third class of serv servant. He's told, and he doesn't do it. Or he half does it. Then the second class of servant, he's told, and he does it. And the first class of servant, he does it without being told because he understands the heart of his guru. Uh, uh,